Welcome, everybody, to Crystal Kyle and Friends. Today, we're talking to Matt Christman, or as some may call him, Matt Christman. That's what I call him. Nobody calls him that. You're the only <laughs> one who calls him that, I guess. <laughs> of Chapo Trap House. Uh, brilliant guy. Really excited to talk to him. Uh, but before we get to that, um, so you have for me, I haven't seen this yet. So yeah. you're gonna be, you guys are going to be getting my, like, in the moment live, reaction live here. Live react. Um, apparently, so Rick Scott's 11-point plan is gonzo. They kicked that to the curb, I guess, mm-hmm. because it was so bad. Right. The Republican right. plan. Yeah. So now Kevin McCarthy's come out with his own one. Yeah. So here's the background. OK. Mitch McConnell, I think wisely, just from a pure Machiavellian standpoint, was like, we are not running on anything. We are not going to tell the voters what we stand for, because I know that what we stand for is not popular. So we're just going to keep our mouth shut. By the way, he's right. He's correct. He's right. Okay? Yeah. So Rick Scott initially, who the, the whole Rick Scott McConnell feud that's going on right now. I don't know if you guys have been following this, but it's delicious and I'm enjoying it. But yeah, me too. Rick Scott went ahead and freelanced with his own. OK, well, I'm going to put out my plan for what Republicans oh, should do. Oh, it's so bad. And he's in charge of the National Republic. He's not just some random senator. He's in charge of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, supposed to be charged with getting Republicans elected to the Senate. So he puts this thing out and it's like, we're going to get rid of Social Security. We're going to raise taxes on the working class. <laughs> oh, it's everything yeah. is so bad. It, it was literally honest wait, about what they actually want to do. There was a plank that was like, we stand for the flag. You made a list of the 11 things that you're going to do for the country because you're a politician. One of the fucking things is we're going to stand for the flag. There's a little bit of that in this one that I'm about to tell you about. So (laughs) so also House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is trying to be Speaker of the House also has this idea of like, no, we've got to run on something. And I know that this comes from a lot of times the donor class is big on this. Like, you know, we need to we need to have something affirmative and we need to tell the American people about what we're going to do in office because they don't really get. That what Mitch McConnell gets, which is that their ideas are like terrible yeah, and nobody agrees with you. People hate. Mm, yeah. Okay. You so got thirty anyway, percent max. Kevin McCarthy has now worked with Newt Gingrich <laughs> to I come love this. to come up with their version <laughs> of the um, contract with for America. America. Contract for America. 96, so it was contract Gingrich with is... America in ninety four. Now okay. this is commitment to America. It's going to be announced in Pittsburgh on September nineteenth to tell voters why they should vote for Republicans, not just against Democrats, in November. And this is an Axios report. So here is what they leak to Axios is going to be in this. Hit me. Um, they say the document will be relatively small and they are going to have, um, four major commitments here. Number one, an economy that is strong. This section specifically focuses on inflation, high gas prices, supply chain issues, and competition with China. McCarthy advises members to pledge to put an end to build back better and eliminate wasteful government spending. So, so there, let's make the economy strong provision is let's make it worse by not doing the things that would make it strong or not and rolling back the bare minimum things that the biden administration has done to make life better for people and by the way i love when they list things like inflation and gas prices like okay we get that those are issues what, what are, are you, you going to do? do well and that's the thing is like they're on team have the fed hike the rates so is the biden administration so induce a recession way, yeah induce a recession mm-hmm. they're on that team and they're also on the team like let's have um no cuts to defense spending of course but cuts across the board in terms of social welfare spend the paul the old paul ryan approach oh. so wait read it one more time there was something else in there i wanted to respond to inflation high gas prices supply chain issues and competition with china okay supply chain issues what are you going to do to fix the supply chain what right. do you mean like what does that mean Yeah, we have supply chain issues. You want to bring back American manufacturing by doing massive investments here? No. No, you don't mean (laughs) that. Yeah, you don't mean that that at all. (laughs) And that is part of it. And even the like competition with China stuff, I I mean, that could also mean like massive industrial policy investments here, middle class jobs, industrial capacity. They definitely don't mean that. See, but that's interesting because there's a split in the GOP. The Trump approach was like do tariffs and try to do some semblance of protectionism, even though he had net outsourcing under his administration. So it was like tough on China in that respect. But the standard right-wing approach prior to Trump was the exact opposite. Yeah. It was like, let's ship all of our jobs to China. Hooray. Yeah. Let the markets do their job. Right, exactly. Yeah. And there's still a lot of that in the modern GOP. Of course, yeah. Most of them. Um, The closest thing that kind of falls in this category that uh, has happened under the Biden administration, the CHIPS Act, 
most of the Republican Party voted against that. Yeah, well, they get like nine votes or something. They got I think the, they got the bare minimum. The bare minimum yeah. to get it passed through the Senate. Yeah. So mm-hmm. most of the caucus seems to not be on board with the direction yeah, they, of industrial So policy. in other words, most of the caucus did not want to bring back American manufacturing. So basically, this plank is just about like deficit cutting, social welfare cutting. That's what this boils okay. down to. Hit me with the next one. Next is a nation that is safe. With a focus on crime and immigration, Republicans vowed to, quote, secure the southern border, reduce crime and stop fentanyl and defend our national security. OK, first of all, do, do you see what they did there? They linked crime and immigration mm-hmm. as if they naturally go together mm-hmm. when every single study I've seen on this. And this is quite apart from what your own personal opinion is on immigration. You could be for it, you could be against it, you could have a middle of the road opinion on it. But either way, the numbers are crystal clear. It was the right wing Cato Institute that did a study not too long ago that found that Uh, Not only do documented immigrants commit crime at a lower rate than native Americans, but undocumented immigrants do, too. So that's a dirty, dirty trick they just did there. That's like almost uh, like a a, what do they call it? A a dog whistle. Yeah. To the old, you know, southern strategy type thing. Oh, crime and immigration. And by the way, what I hate about these guys, too, is they never acknowledge that Biden has largely agreed with them on the border. Biden has been very, very tough on the border. So I. And also the thing about let's stop fentanyl, it's like all I see all these tweets from Republican politicians that are like the Border Patrol just sees like 87 gigatons of fentanyl down at the border today. And they say it as if it's like there's a problem there. But it's like, wait, you're saying that the problem was solved. So shouldn't you be like, hooray, we stopped 87 gigatons of fentanyl. Yeah, well, not to I mean, their whole approach to drug addiction and overdose is antiquated and has never worked. We've tried, you know, tough on drugs for a 100 years now. And guess what? We just have a, the worst addiction and overdose crisis that we have in our nation's and, history. And that's what they mean, too. when they're like, we're going to be tough on crime. Because the same thing as the, the 1994 crime bill, which Biden, of course, supported and helped write. It's this yeah. idea of like, well, if you go after the low level crimes, then it has like a trickle down effect and it cleans up the country. The broken so, windows. Right. So leasing theory. So yeah. go after, you know, the, the low level drug dealer who didn't do anything violent. That's I mean, what they mean. Trump is saying, like, execute the drug Trump, dealers. He's all the way in on that. He's leaning into it even more, which is kind of crazy because this is a dude who did the First Step Act, which was a good piece of legislation, which went in the opposite direction. And he pardoned Alice Johnson, which is a good thing. And now he's talking about kill drug dealers because he sees that, what do you bring up, China or Singapore or something? He's like, they kill them over there. They have no problem. They have no problem whatsoever. It's like, you fucking psychopath. You're going full authoritarian on us. Yeah. And you're when we're, I'm supposed to be upset when somebody uses the F word, fascist, to describe them? Yeah, I mean, don't we have the most incarcerated in the society world. in the world? Correct. So, yeah, locking up more people. That's a, that's a problem. All right, next up, we've got a future that is free. Section headers include... Make sure every kid in every neighborhood can succeed. Better ca- that is free. <laughs> better care and improved health outcomes for all Americans. That one's interesting. What the hell are they going to do there? I mean, all they ever do is like, you know, posture and carry water for the drug companies and every institutional health care interest. Confront big tech and advance free speech. I don't, I can't. I mean, They've, they've had so many opportunities to like, actually stand up to big tech and and still matt stoller who i think really did went out of his way to give republicans a fair hearing about their like opposition and big tech and whatever i mean he really has been making the case recently that there's no hope for these people they had all kinds of um chances to go up against moneyed corporate interests and they don't every time they actually when it comes down to it side with big tech side with big corporate america so yeah Yeah, I mean, I was, oh, you know, my take on this. I've always been of the opinion. I don't know how anybody falls for the posturing of Republican politicians. Yeah. Every now and then a Democrat will throw a bone with at least a semi-popular slash populist policy. The Republicans have never done it. Well, think about in the Biden administration, just to give a specific example. I mean, the um, they have nominated some uh, some really like strong people in terms of antitrust. Right. Do you see Republicans like? Celebrating yeah, they that? oppose no. it. No. And then uh, remember they're, they're, they're suing, I think it's Facebook, over their acquisition in the virtual space. And, like, it was a total partisan divide in terms yes. of the members yeah. of the board that decided to sue them. So, yeah, they're, they're all talking. Th- and obviously they're full of shit on free speech. They just want to be of able to course. say the things they want to say and have control over the censorship. To them, standing up to big tech is a culture war issue because they yeah. know that their base hates big tech. So they're like, we're going to stand up to big tech. And then the second they have an opportunity to vote to take on big tech, they're like... No. 
Did I mean I was going to do that, bro? Not really. Yeah, bro. they'll send out a tweet about how, like, Facebook is silencing conservatives right, yeah. or whatever that's about. And, and they'll do there. And by the way, the uh, a future that's free thing, I, I always wince when they talk about that because, like, the first thing you would do if you actually believed in freedom was legalize marijuana and free the nonviolent drug offenders, which, again, is the opposite of what these of people want to do. I yeah. also love the better care and improved health outcomes for all Americans. That's so carefully wordsmithed to avoid it's saying that you're going to actually do anything for anybody. Yeah. It's a fortune cookie. Anyway, hit me I, I wonder if one. they're still on the like repeal Obamacare thing. I well, mean, I feel like they've moved on. from. Maybe that. when they get to the specifics, they might bring it up. But yeah. OK, the last one is a government that is accountable. The final section emphasizes the extent of the oversight efforts. Now, this is the real thing they're going to do. Republicans are promising next year if they take back the majority, including a pledge to, quote, ensure safe and fair elections, which is their nod to the stop the steal bullshit. But this is the only part that they, if they get control, are actually going to do. You're going to investigate um, Hunter Biden. Yeah. Investigate mm -hmm. Hunter Biden, investigate Anthony Fauci, investigate God knows what else um, they already have. Oh, they want to investigate like the origins of the January 6th committee or something like that. Um, they want to investigate Merrick Garland. So they've got a whole list. Merrick Garland? Over the Trump Look, FBI raid stuff. I yeah. get the argument for like Fauci. There's an argument there. Yeah, the I get the stuff, argument whatever. for Hunter in terms of the corrupt business. I get it. I get it. Really? We're talking about who else was on the list? Merrick Garland. Yeah, Garland? I mean, he, and the January, something about the January 6th committee. Investigate yeah, the investigators investigate. type yeah, shit. Yeah, ah, fuck out of here. Yeah. But you're right. That is the That's thing that the they're one actually going to do. Really do. Cause it's just mm -hmm. similar with how, remember when the Democrats got in there, um, Manchin, I think it was David Sirota who reported, maybe it was Ryan Grimm who reported that Manchin literally said to his Republican colleagues, like, Hey guys, let's do this investigation thing of January 6th. Cause then that sucks all the air out of the room and we're not solely talking about build back better and all those different provisions so if we talk about this we're not doing policy win-win for everybody right and it seems like a similar thing for the republicans where they're like let's just do nothing and talk about hunter biden all day and yeah. then that'll that everybody will go into their little you know culture war sycophantic camps mm -hmm. and we'll all be good and people will keep suffering and dying and making no money that's the play that's yeah. exactly the play and so um i do the one thing that was noteworthy to me that wasn't in this list is remember a while back kevin mccarthy had made these noises about like oh if we get control of congress we're gonna pass the stock ban for members trading somehow that Somehow that has fallen off the table. I'm so surprised. That's what I say to that. So yeah. Anyway, Republicans anyway, passing a stock it. ban. The Democrats don't even do it. Of course, the Republicans are not going to do it. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah, no. It's not they, would happening. Like, they would like mandate you have to trade corruptly. <laughs> that would be their move. <laughs> you must participate I will say, in our great free market. I will say. Yeah. Better than Rick Scott's. Yeah, and well, here's why because okay, it's so but, vague. Well, but this is also this just the preliminary. Outline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't when have all the, the specifics yet. So. But I still think it'll be better than Rick I think, Scott. I, I still think, think they probably will be smart enough to not include a provision to like raise taxes on everyone and sunset Social Security. By they the probably way, will be smart enough not to do that. Rick Scott <laughs> took out the provision on raising taxes on the bottom 50 percent with, you know, you got to have skin in the game. Skin in the game. He yeah. took that out because it was other Republicans turned on him like, oh, you fucking idiot. He was going on the, the Sunday shows and they were grilling him. This guy is hated rick scott oh he's the it's worst like real i mean and i'm not just talking about hated by people like us like, no even in the caucus they clearly mitch mcconnell despises this man and a lot of other ones because the minute that he went on his little italian super yacht vacation or whatever that shit leaked immediately and you know that came from a republican by the way he's most known for doing the worst Medicare fraud in American history. Right. He defrauded Medicare. Right. Yeah. That's what he's most known for. So guess what? They gave him the reins of the the arm to elect the Republicans. Mm -hmm. He, you know, millions of dollars he was in control of. Yeah. Now what's oh, going on with that? They're like, he blew it all. It, they had like <laughs> you gave it to the defraud guy. And he and defrauded he blew everybody it all. again. He did literally. I mean, okay. So first of all. There's so much here because he clearly came in with this, like, I'm the businessman and I know how to do things better than it's ever been done before. And they had a war chest of like, okay, it was 150 million or 180 million, something like that. He's like, I'm going to spend all of it on digital to grow our grassroots fundraising list. Well, that didn't work at all. It's a net loss. 
their grassroots fundraising, normally during an election cycle, grass like online donations go up and up and up as you get closer to election day. It makes sense as people tune in. Theirs is going in the opposite direction, which is the opposite of the Democrats. So this is not like an overall political donation phenomenon. And he's trying to make the case like, oh, I spent early to, you know, get out in front to find our candidates, but their candidates are all losing. So that doesn't make sense either. And then to the fraudster part, their tactics were so aggressive that even when red, which is the like Republican online donation yeah. platform, people banned were dropping them. No, yeah. banned oh, them snap. from using those tactics. So they were texting people and saying like, should Joe Biden resign? And then it will say, it would say like, reply yes to donate. So these oh. boomers would be like, yes. And then their credit cards would get hit without them even oh. realizing. It was a scam artist is so, a scam artist. Right. Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? <laughs> and look, political fundraising is always like skeezy and manipulative and whatever. But they went so far that even the Republican donating platform was like, mm, come on, guys. That's it in crazy. A little bit. Yeah. And he's really something, that guy. Yep. Anyway. Uh, all right. So. Now I want to talk about this poll that just came out, CBS News yeah, poll. Interesting. This is really interesting. So they asked the question, and I don't know what this is apropos of, right? Because it's apropos of nothing, apparently. Of but having a lot of old people in office. Yeah, but it's, it's been like that for a while. It's weird that this was asked now. But anyway, uh, the question is, should there be maximum age limits for elected officials? That's the question. Listen to this. 73% of all adults say yes, age limits. Hmm. 73 only 27% say no. Um, let me break it down a little bit for you by uh, demographic. So among Democrats, 71%, yes, maximum age limit. 75% among independents, 75% among Republicans. So Democrats were the lowest number and they were 71%. Um, let me do well, it that's, by- That's probably because they are like, well, Joe, Joe Biden is old as fuck. And still 71 like is him. super high. Mm -hmm. uh, very high. Very high. Yeah. Uh, then we have by age. So this is interesting. Um, actually, it's the youngest people who are most likely, most lenient most on age. Most skeptical of the age limit. Yes. Thing. So 68%, okay. this is the low number, 68% for age 18 to 29. Hmm. Then you have 30, age 30 to 44, it's 75% say yes, maximum age limit. Age 45 to 64, 75%. Mm -hmm. And then age 65 plus, 74%. Hmm. So even the old people are like, don't allow me in government. I, I mean, I've heard a lot of um, of our elders express like, I know how I'm slowing down and I cannot imagine being president of the United States. So that doesn't particularly surprise me. Now I'm going to give you what they say the number should be. You ready? This is interesting. So they ask, should you be banned at age 50? 8% said yes, <laughs> which is like 8% too many. That's fucking crazy. That is crazy. Really? Like what? <laughs> 50, nah, you're over the hill. 50, Done. really? What are you, the, 50, are you like Gen X? Are you? If you're 50 right now, you're probably Gen, Gen X. X. Yeah, yeah, you're probably Gen X. Okay. Um, age 60, 26%. I might support just banning all Gen Xers. <laughs> I like the old ones. Keep the silent Gen. That's fine. But maybe get rid of the Gen X. Honestly, silent Gen is sometimes a little yikesy. So, well, they can go either way. They're either the best, like Bernie. True. Or the worst. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not as biased against Gen X as you are. Really? I've had plenty of lovely experiences with Gen X. OK, that's nice. Of you. That's nice. Yeah. No, I mean. I was going to say what my biggest bias is against, but I'm not going to say anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so age uh, at age 70, this was the highest number. Forty percent say at age 70, it should be banned. I just feel like all the Gen X politicians are like Beto. I think my issue is less with the generation it's as a whole. It's with Beto and Mayor Pete. It's that's like who you hate. Beto and Mayor, Mayor yeah, that's Pete. Who you, I'm by like, the way, I'm you totally are with the, you on that. Are the worst. Yeah. And that's, and, or like Kamala, and she's probably Gen X. That's the vibe. Yeah, Kamala's that's probably the vibe Gen X. from the Gen X politicians. That I mean, or hey, like look, Marco Rubio. You're making me flip here. You're make, making a strong case. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not. I feel like <laughs> Be, to me, Beto is the classic Gen X politicians he's like riding a skateboard well, and all this stuff was I was like so oh my god dude whack. yeah and then that's, people that's where my bias comes from just as to explain that it's not I, a blanket hatred of all gen x i have heard other people say who are gen xers be like he was in a band uh. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway so uh but then you have at age 80 it's 18 percent say they should be uh that should be the maximum age limit age yeah. 92 percent so the biggest it says 70 should be the cutoff really 70 70 should be the cutoff <laughs> so wipes out all of house democratic leadership um i think literally 
I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I don't think Schumer would be the youngest one, right? And he's not 69. Well, I said House. I'm not sure about the Senate. Oh, okay. But yeah, I mean, House How old is Chuck Schumer? Pelosi, Clyburn, like, yeah, these people are all. Chuck Schumer, 71. So. Sorry. It's all of them. So anyway, so, all right. So let's out. talk a little bit about this. First of yeah. all, I'm surprised by how high this number is. I really mm-hmm. am. Um, I'm kind of not, but it's really also, 73% is a lot. I, I'm also not really buying the numbers though, because at the same time that you have 73% saying this, you also have, you know, a majority of Democrats like, yeah, let's do, let's like, let's go with Biden and Trump again. I mean, that's what we're going to end up with. So the way that people feel about this and then the way they actually act and vote, I think it's very different. So I, that's partly true. I think the point you're missing though, is if it were to come up for a vote, the majority of the country would actively want it to pass, Mm -hmm. which means they do kind of still believe it. I mean, you're right that they're hypocrites and that they say, well, the old politician I like is cool. Right. But if there was a actual vote on this, which there's not going to be because these are all old gremlins anyway, who are (laughs) right in front of us, right? Yeah. Yeah. But so it's not going to happen, but people would actively support it. But we've had this conversation before on air, but I'm going to ask you, what do you think about? No, I don't support it. I, I, I'm not sure I support any limits on who could be president. What I support is more democratic, small d democratic means of evaluating candidates and their capabilities. So being required, for example, to engage in public debates, being qu- required to take, you know, questions from the press, including the hostile press, those sorts of things. So voters have more of an ability to assess the competence and the capability of the candidates. That's what I'm in favor of. But no, I don't support, I don't really support term limits. I don't support age limits. I don't support age minimums. I think that um, if you really believe in democracy, people should have the choice of what kind of candidates they want to put in office. And if at the moment they feel like Joe Biden at 90 years old is their best freaking choice, it's kind of a sad state of affairs. But um, I accept that. I mean, I find that interesting because I do feel I feel like you have a consistent standard, which most people don't have. Yeah, and I feel like I've struggled to develop a consistent standard when talking about issues like this, because I ne- I don't I don't really have a problem with like that lower age limit. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Which means in principle, I'm open to an age limit. So if you put one on the lower end, why wouldn't you put one on the top end? You know what I'm saying? But yeah, but I will admit, uh, you know, honestly, I think it just stems from a status quo bias of my own on this issue yeah. that like right now we have a minimum age limit. So I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. But we don't have an upper age limit. Right. I'm like, yeah, I kind of agree with us not having an upper age limit, you know? Right. Like I think if they were right now, if there had never been an age limit and they were going to, I mean, in, at the bottom end and they were going to institute one, I think you'd be opposed to it. You think so? I do. If you, if they were like, you can't have a 13 year old run in the country. I don't, well, you have to have enough faith in people that they're not going to vote for a freaking 13 year old. Oh, that's but, what it comes you down know, to is I, you like actually like have faith in the democratic process. And that's why I support requiring more democracy. So there's more like a, a ability to evaluate these cans, rather, but, whether they're really up to the task. See, but, but there are, okay, there are limits to that. Like my general love of democracy is in agreement with you, but mm-hmm. I understand the downsides of it. Like that's the whole reason why the idea of a constitution exists because if you leave everything open to a democratic vote sometimes not only will the people get it wrong they'll get it fucking wildly wrong like there are polls that show people want to be able to regulate speech like you should be locked up if you say something that's super offensive on that front people are just wrong because they want to democratically take away people's rights by the same token if in 1959 you took a vote in mississippi the overwhelming majority would say yeah we need segregation segregation is the way it works yeah but that's but protecting a right is different from what we're talking about here. I'm just trying like, to... In fact, I think I'm protecting the rights of the I'm just, 80-year-olds to be able to seek elected office. I'm just trying to make the point that you have to temper your democracy is the only thing argument. Because sure. it's not. There's other things that really matter that you're balancing here. Like term limits, for example. You wrote up term limits. I'm way more torn on term limits than you are. Because hmm. the idea of a term limit is, look, if we mandate you can only be in for a certain amount of time, what you're doing is you're protecting against somebody from doing the ultimately corrupt thing and staying in there for their life. So even though you are by definition doing something undemocratic by saying there's a term limit in a weird way, you're actually also protecting democracy by saying this person is never going to become a dictator. Right. But on the other hand, how do you feel about FDR? I think he's pretty hot. Right. Same. (laughs) Pretty sexy. You know what I'm saying? I just err very much, very strongly on the side of people decide 
they want to keep this member of Congress in office for a long time. They really like this person that they're, you know, deliver feel they're delivering for their district. And there's a democratic process to actually be able to evaluate this person. So you don't have like a Diane Feinstein situation well, where she's just like up. protected. That was for my counter argument. And, you know, doesn't even know where she is anymore. But, but the way they're able to do that is because she doesn't have to face the public at all. She doesn't have to do public debate. See, I, on this, I think I'm just a little more pessimistic than you, because I think even if she was forced to face the public, she might still fucking win. <laughs> and then people are well, democratically got, choosing somebody who's dying. Problems. I mean, if if you realistically think that we're in danger of like nominating and making a 13 year old president, then I think we have bigger problems than like the age limits in our Listen, constitution. Alex Jones amassed millions of viewers. Yeah, but he's not president. But he amassed millions of viewers. My point is, okay, well, sometimes should, maybe, unexpected. Should we, Donald should we Trump became Alex president. Alex Jones off the internet then because no, we have to protect no, ourselves no, no. from the people. Listen, you're not understanding the whole point of me making this counter argument here. Okay. I actually agree with you on the broader point. I think it would create more problems than it would solve if you put in an upper term limit thing. But yeah. I just don't think these arguments are all that persuasive to somebody who might disagree. Like, I don't want to be denied the opportunity to vote for Bernard Sanders at 104 years old. If those are my options, I would vote for, you know, uh, okay. I just, that's what I think about is and, and that's why I think the responses are not Really true, because I guarantee you, if you asked these people, like if it's a hardcore Republican, like, OK, well, then are you going to like say I'm not going to vote for Trump at 80? I'd rather have. They're hypocrites. I got you. Yeah, that's the point yeah, you've yeah, made. Yeah. That's the point I agree with. There's no doubt about that. So all I'm I, trying to say yeah, is I'm don't. Just, I feel like people should have the full range of options and don't constrain who's able to run and sort it out in the Democratic process. I agree. But don't pretend like there aren't colossal fucking downsides to how we do it now, because like half of these motherfuckers in Washington, D.C., like their noses are falling off their face and their hands are black because they're disintegrating right in front of our, remember the yeah. thing with Mitch McConnell, his hand was turning black, right. like their brains are not working. Yeah, and then it, also, wait, hold on one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have technology, right? Is a big issue in today's world. And you got a whole bunch of idiots who don't even know how to but turn on a goddamn not, computer who not, are deciding things for the future. It's not clear to me that the problem in Washington is that they're old. No, it's the corruption. Every, yeah. Yes, of course. So but, it's not like the young ones are better. Like it really irritates me. In some me. ways they are. You'll get, you'll, You'll get candidates who just run like Pete did this. He's like generational change. And all he wanted was the same thing. But, but I'm younger. I'm younger. Right. And I fucking hate that. Me too. That's it's terrible. stupid. So it's just I don't think that the problem in Washington is the fact that they're old. I think the problem is that they're corrupt and their ideology sucks. OK, I think the problem is that they're corrupt, that their ideology sucks. But there is still another issue, which is they're they don't know what the fuck's going on because they're a trillion years old and they're not even up on the basic shit that they need to be up on like think of these judges on courts who like if the supreme court hears a case that involves like internet security or privacy or some shit like there's no way they're gonna get it right sure they don't know how to work it's there, like remember there the are hearing oh there. facebook hearing remember yeah, that where yeah, they were asking yeah, yeah. the questions like i can't log into my twitter mr mark zuckerberg yeah, what's the again, problem with your site but again is the reason they haven't taken on big tech that they're old and don't understand it no the reason is because they're corrupt uh, that's the problem crystal we agree you keep bringing up things that we agree on all i'm trying to do is make the point that there's a reason why 73 percent feel the way they feel sure i disagree with them but i understand why they feel like you know i turn on the tv and somebody who's like 98 years old is barely making coherent sentences and it's like it might be time to wrap it up son that's the other thing, like, Pelosi, go away, go away, go away. Nobody fucking wants you here anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, just, And that's not true, by the way. Her district does want her there. Exactly, but, like, yeah, yeah the kind of, when you look at her approval rating in the country, what is it, like, 20-something percent? Like, are you kidding me? They just go away, go away. And these dinosaurs who are there for as long as they are there, I think they do make a decent argument for term limits, which is why I'm more torn on term limits than you are. Yeah, but for— Because it's like, go. I'd, I'd even rather have somebody who's equally as corrupt as you, but not you. <laughs> Well, there is something to be said, though, for um, like, it's not all downsides as you get older. There is a wisdom. wisdom. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. And and having experience in the position is a real thing as well. So there are advantages Adam, to being an outsider. Adam, so, so on. There are also, you know, there is a like knowledge and experience space that if wielded properly can be useful and helpful. 
But at bottom, as we do agree on, the problem is not their age. The problem is not their like demographic characteristics. The problem is not which generation they come from. The problem is their corruption. Yeah, ultimately, I ain't letting you fuckers take Bernie Sanders from me. I'm not. There the Grim go. Reaper is going to have to take Bernie Sanders from me. That's the <laughs> bottom line on that. So I do, I do agree with you overall, but I also think I'm surprised by how big the number is, but I wouldn't have been surprised by, let's say, 55 percent or 60 mm-hmm. percent that said, yeah. But you're, you're right. Ultimately, now to make your argument, it's like people know something's really, really, really wrong in Washington, D.C. Yeah. You know, but it's like I don't think they can really put their finger on exactly what it is. So it's almost like any idea you throw at them, like, how about this? They'll be like, yeah, let's do let's that. Do it. It's different. Yeah. You know, I'm I am more uh, in favor of term limits and age limits and whatever for positions that are not elected that like I'm just I'm thinking of Supreme Court just, justices. So like to say, right, okay, yeah. you're done at 70 or you're done at 60. I think that's a no whatever. brainer. Like, I wouldn't me, I would do it. That's a totally different. Thing. I would do it five years or 10 years, something like that. I wouldn't fucking. Yeah. You got to make it something that's asynchronous with the political cycle, you know, but yeah. And, and there was polling before. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it was the same deal. Like basically every single reform you proposed to the Supreme Court, people were like, yeah, do that. And do it was, that. it do was that. huge, yeah. huge <laughs> numbers majority. on that front. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, all right, there's your breakdown guys. I thought that was, I, I think that's an interesting conversation, Very but I am surprised by how overwhelming the numbers are. Anyway, let's get to our boy, Matt. So Matt Chrisman is the, uh, one of the hosts of Chapo Trap House. He's hilarious. He's brilliant. Let's go ahead and talk to him. All right. Matt Chrisman's here with us of Chapo Trap House. And, uh, your, I like your, your Kush blogs because, I watch them and uh, they're both simultaneously really intellectually stimulating, but then also like 70% of the time, I'm like, I don't even know exactly what he's saying, but I like it. <laughs> so uh, I'll live with that ratio. That's fine. <laughs> either way, I think the, the main point is I enjoy it, which is all that really matters. So anyway, thanks so much for joining us. Exactly. Man. As I was just telling you off Thank air, you. Thank you very much. I've been a fan of Chapo for, uh, for a very long time. Um, and we've had Felix on before. So let's, let's start with this. So, Chris, we were just talking about this off air, but uh, the queen is apparently <laughs> on death's doorstep Killing. right now. I don't know why I'm laughing. All the Forgive royal me. family is rushing <laughs> to the bedside. So yeah, that probably means. Yeah. Uh, how sad are you over this, Matt? I mean, only you can't only be so sad because, you know, uh, you got to remember with the royal family, death is really only a transition into another uh, horrifying state. I mean, She's not really going to be dead. She's just going to be not something that you would want to put on camera. So, you know, she'll be dead officially, but in reality, she'll be probably still in Buckingham Palace hanging from the ceiling somewhere. Yeah. Like, how do you beat what they have now going? You know what I'm saying? Like, they're already like super wealthy for absolutely no reason whatsoever. They get all the opulence in the world, all the wealth in the world. Like, whatever happens next, it's like... Well, there's a even weird, if there is a heaven, which there isn't. But. There's a weird turn of events, too, because the new UK prime minister, Liz Truss, had like, I guess when she was younger, she was like, the monarchy is ridiculous and stupid. Based. To get rid of it. And yeah. She's <laughs> like, you know, she's changed her mind. Yeah. I mean, she decided that she wanted to be prime minister. And beca- that's she's one of those things that everyone knows, but only it can only be said if you have no if aspirations have in politics. Ambitions. Yeah, yeah, she's Margaret. She's yeah. literally like Margaret Margaret Thatcher reincarnate. I don't know if you saw, like, she did all the photo ops that Margaret Thatcher did over yeah, her career, like, like her sitting in the tank and, and yeah, literally copying it, like, wearing the exact same thing that she wore on one of her, like, inauguration days or whatever the fuck. How soulless do you have to be to do that? I mean, soulless enough to, yeah, like, I mean, uh, we imagine how bad you have to kind of destroy yourself to seek power in the United States. But imagine doing it in, in England where you, they actually do have this monstrously reptilian Royal family <laughs> who uh, all are doing just spine chillingly awful ritual violence that you have to be aware of, but agree never to mention. And probably at some point have to participate in to prove that you're cool. <laughs> prove you got the stuff of what it takes to make it exactly um, i yeah. i think we both played on our shows the clip of uh the new prime minister getting asked this question which was a crazy question to start with where it was like so the moment comes and you've got to like annihilate the world with nuclear weapons i'm not going to ask you whether you do it because i know you would <laughs> how would you feel uh, it goes without question 
<laughs> right. Right. Like, that's the part that you don't have a question about, that you'd be, like, ready to just destroy the planet. And all, all for yeah, Oxford training all, kicked in, too. And she was like, I would feel nothing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that had been something that they stitched up Corbin for, is that when they asked him that, he said, no, I would not do that. Why would I do that? Oh, really? Why would I it ever be... That. Why would it ever be the British prime minister's responsibility to nuclearly cook Earth? I mean, at that point, you're just doing it so that, like, you can put some points on the scoreboard in the Megadeth tolls because your piddly ass Trident missiles are not going to be the deciding factor. She seems like uniquely soulless. I saw that clip of her with uh, on Saudi Arabia, too, where she was asked like a very simple question about Saudi Arabia. And she was like, well, they're uh, an important ally or something. So, yeah, hands off. It's funny because there used to be like this thing where you would have to mimic the reasonable things in public. And then the private position was like the grotesque uh, insider elitist world. But now we're at the point where, like, since all the fucking norms and shit are gone, it's just you just wear it out in the open. You're just like, yeah, we uh, let Saudi Arabia get away with anything because they're our ally and oil. So that's cool, right? Yeah, are you triggered? Yeah, I'm very triggered. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> so um, let me ask you this, because right before we came on air here, I just saw that uh, it looks like Steve Bannon's actually going down for that build the wall scam that he did. There were federal charges at one point and he was found guilty, but then Trump pardoned him. And then New York State stepped in and said, we're just going to charge you with the same thing, but at the state level. And you were describing to me how double jeopardy doesn't really apply and how they changed the law in New yeah, York. Yeah, they actually to, explicitly changed the law to make so, it possible to charge people like Bannon. Yeah. And so that was like the world's most obvious scam that I've ever seen. I remember covering it at the time. And it's like, how are you going to privately crowdfund a border wall on public land? That's public. Like you can't. And I know you told all oh, they'll buy up some. You can't buy up the thousands of miles of it's not even all for sale. So to buy it and crowdfund a wall seems sort of like impossible. So it was an obvious grift. That guy, Cole Fage, who was his partner, was buying yachts and shit. And Bannon was, you know, it was just, it was just so clear. But the fact that he's going down over this sort of, you know, it makes me feel about Trump a similar way too. I'm curious if you feel the same way I do is that for the longest time I bought into like the Teflon Don narrative because all the evidence in front of us was like, this motherfucker gets away with anything and everything that he ever does ever. But now he's got like 17 lawsuits piled up all on top of one another. He got the civil lawsuit in New York over his businesses, which is like he could theoretically face the corporate death penalty or have a big fine against him as a result of that. You got the case in Georgia where he was on the phone saying, like, find me 11,000 votes. You got the DOJ and FBI thing over the classified information. And now more news came out. Indeed, it was some nuclear shit, even though it was foreign nuclear stuff, not U.S. nuclear stuff. Um And now we just learned again, right before coming on air, his Save America PAC is being investigated by the DOJ and there's a federal grand jury that's already impaneled over it. So I look at that and I think, how can one of these not work? Like the 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 two the um, grand jury one right now with the Save America PAC, he basically took two hundred fifty million dollars from his own supporters and said this is going to be to stop the steal. Yeah. And then they pocketed all the fucking money in like the most brazen way possible. So do you feel like. Hey, something's actually going to happen this time. Or do you still feel like the Teflon Don thing is like, you know, in effect, in effect permanently? Well, first of all, uh, Bannon looks like he's cooked now, but uh, wait for Don Jr. to become governor of New York and then he will get a state level pardon. Um, uh, I, I I have really felt like they there is a vested institutional interest in not having presidents uh, uh face any sort of justice you know because the job is to do crimes and uh but i also think at this point there is a equal vested interest in uh turning trump into the outlier to the outsider to the uh sort of example of what not to be uh the the, like if you do this kind of stuff then all of those protections and that assumed mantle of invincibility uh they are revoked because uh, his continued i think what it boils down to is his insistence on running on delegitimizing the 2020 election is just it's too much because you you have uh this uh capillary action where from the grassroots up into you know uh from from school boards to state senate seats to secretary of states in states uh, that are going to be, you know, close in 2024, 
uh, the election of fully true believing glassy eyed uh, Trump loyalists who are willing to take at face value his ideas about just abrogating elections. And that is a existential threat to uh, too many profit flows, I think, to be allowed to keep going, whether they actually have any ability or intention to bring him down like legally, or rather, if this is just an attempt to create sort of a death by a thousand cuts that will hopefully drag him down as he tries to seek uh, another term, I don't know. Uh, it does seem, though, that they're going to have to, whoever, whatever forces want to see him neutralized is going to have to contend with the fact that he did spend his term in office filling the federal judiciary with real hardcore loyalists, like yeah. the special master person who uh, has thrown a huge <laughs> um, wrench into the gears of the of the espionage investigation. Right. So uh, I'm not really sure. When you say there is a vested interest in, you know, there was a vested interest in making sure presidents escape all accountability, and now there is a vested interest uh, competing in sort of pushing Trump out of the political sphere. Whose vested interest is that? Like, lay that on, out a little bit more, who you see as um, having the, uh, the, the greatest motives here. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, forgive me for using the word, but like the deep state, you know, the, the elements of uh, political power that rest in bureaucracy uh, that also, by the way, extend out of government into things like the media uh, and that uh, without ever coordinating uh, are all independently invested in the maintenance of America's dem uh, political institutions uh, and its um, uh, and the econ economy that the political institutions uh, uh, are intertwined with. Uh, and so like it was, you saw that at, on January 6th when there was this huge flight of like uh, corporate leaders away from Trump and this, this rallying uh, 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 against the idea that the election had been fraudulent. Now that has changed a little bit over, uh, that changed over time as, it became clear that the Democrats weren't really going to be able to press uh, hard enough on that point and that the general public was not going to have some sort of uh, come to Jesus moment where they all realized that Trump was a bad guy and that his supporters were still going to be there and there were still going to be consumers with uh, money to spend and votes to uh, offer to primary and general elections. Uh, but now with him with the set with the prospect of him running for re-election and with his appeal at the state level uh, only getting stronger uh, and with the supreme court going to hear a case about uh that might allow for state legislatures to essentially abrogate uh whatever uh elections in their state uh without any check uh the I think the immediate the urgency has is kicked back up. I don't know any other way to uh, make sense of them deciding to break into mar lago 16 months or whatever it is after he left office when everybody knew what was there from day one. He can't keep a secret worth it, worth his life. Uh, it does seem like there's some sort of shift at high levels among people deciding that Trump is more of is a th threat worth neutralizing. Mm. Yeah, I. So I, I take all that in. It does seem like there's almost sort of like a, a war among the elites and the deep state behind the scenes. I think I, I'm like cautiously optimistic. I'm like 60, 40 on the side of something's got to happen here that's going to, you know, sort of end his future prospects if they're not already ended, because I think in a general election right now, he'd get waxed by almost anybody. But um, I think the thing that's tempering my optimism is that I, I sincerely believe that it's it's part of the democratic core. Like this is how the Democrats are, that they are going to consider like, oh, what about the backlash if we do the right thing? You know what I mean? And, well, that's and, what he's betting on. You're right. And and Bill Barr even mentioned this. Like there's been a lot of headlines of Bill Barr like beating up on Trump on various right wing media outlets. But fundamentally, he also said one thing which I think was underreported which he made that point too of like, well, look, you're going to have to consider what are the ramifications of this if you do get him on any of the, you know, multitude of crimes that he's guilty of. What's going to happen after that? 
And when you look at somebody like Merrick Garland, <laughs> he strikes me like if I had to guess how Merrick Garland would react, it would be like, yeah, he's probably going to bitch out and be like, you know, it's never happened before in the history of our country that you take down a president like this. So you know, they think they would convince themselves that the proper thing to do for the republic and the democracy or whatever is actually hands off and let him get away with it. So what do you think of that? Do you think that that's that's the way it's going to go, that they might bitch out at the last minute because they're Democrats and that's what they do? Like sort of how like Obama didn't prosecute the Wall Street criminals or, or Bush and Cheney right after when right after he was elected. I mean, it's, I think it's a bit uh, different just because Trump is like Trump does not represent the same forces that uh, that, you know, the, the Wall Street uh criminals of 28 2008 or the tortures of the bush administration did like more embedded uh, uh elements of american power like he really is sort of a, a free agent in a lot of ways and he's sort of carried along by these these um these gusts these popular uh uh groups and 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 some collections of of uh like wealthy and powerful people who are who who see him as useful to their greater project but he is uh, theoretically more isolatable, but he also has a much greater uh, buy-in with with a popular base that I think does definitely scare not just Democrats. I think a lot of uh, uh, government officials are genuinely unnerved by the prospect of of a popular response to um, Trump being impeached or something like. Lindsey Graham has pointed out that there'll be riots in the streets and there would definitely be some level of popular dissent, discontent. Now, I don't think it's anything that uh, could threaten power, uh, but I mean, it could lead to one of these guys getting, you know, shot coming out of their house, which I don't think they want to contemplate. Yeah, I mean, we already had so that. So it is something that they have to consider. Yeah, I mean, we already had that maniac who went and tried to shoot up, like, the FBI office in Ohio. So right. um, it's not, and and we had January 6th, so it's not theoretical to think that there would be yeah, think, some sort of politically violent response. Yeah, I think my guess, I have no idea what's really going to happen. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say that these things just keep piling up. None of them reaches a conclusion. None of them come to trial. But uh, it's just a slow piling up of, of charges and death by a thousand cuts all towards the goal of hampering his viability as an as a candidate in 2024. I was uh, and, I was convinced it, of that yeah. until relatively recently. And now I'm starting to lean in the other direction. The two big things that have sort of shifted my opinion is number one, when in response to the whole like special master situation, the government decided to in their filing, you know, making their case of why there shouldn't be a special master. They really decided to go over the top and make a um, not in a like unjustified way, but make a very um, aggressive public case. They released that photo, which clearly like really upset Trump because it looked like his office was messy or whatever. Um, so that was <laughs> that was to me a sign of like, oh, this is much more aggressive than the normal sort of like conservative posture that the Department of Justice has been taking towards these matters. And then the other thing that sort of shifted my opinion this week was the uh, so the judge rules against the government on the special master thing. And then almost immediately afterwards, there's this big leak to The Washington Post about exactly what type of documents were found at Mar-a-Lago, specifically nuclear sensitive nuclear information about one of our um, about some foreign nation. You know, they went into detail about how it's not just these don't just have to be held inside of the skiff. They have to be like under lock and key inside the skiff. So it's like a skiff within a skiff and only the president and the cabinet level officials, et cetera, et cetera. So. It seems to me they're putting so much in the public space and making such an undeniable case that if this was anybody but Donald Trump, they would already be indicted. They would already be locked up. It would be over for, you know, decades to come. They're putting so much of that out there that it makes it hard then for them politically on the other side to be like, yeah, but we're not going to charge him. I mean, that's true. Like, they really are laying it on. Uh, and they might, I, like I said, I'm not, I don't know, but I do, I do know that if they, th if they really believe that charging him and having a public trial where evidence is presented is going to actually uh, diffuse the problem that they have that yeah. is, go is going to put the toothpaste back in the tube, they're absolutely incorrect. I, I would say that 
the, the number of Trump supporters who would be convinced of his guilt and incapacity for office by any sort of legal procedure uh, is going to be in the single digits. Yes, agreed. Uh, the, and 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 his conviction will only affirm their uh, their fi- their disenchantment with America's institutions and their commitment to overthrowing them uh, legally. I mean, I, th- of course, you know, some of them are going to want to do uh, 1776 or whatever again, but, you know, most of them are uh, relatively comfortable suburbanites. So you're not going to see any like, you know, uh, uh, some sort of mass revolt, but candidates uh, on the Republican side are going to be able to find a very easy entrepot to power by uh, appealing to that sentiment and the the threat that they're thinking that they're going to neutralize isn't going to go anywhere. But don't you think they're kind of in a little bit of a catch-22, though? Because, like, I agree with the analysis, and we saw it happen right after uh, all this unfolded. Trump's popularity went up. It's right. it like all the devastating and damning things kept leaking, leaking, leaking. And then he went up and a lot of that support came from DeSantis and went back to Trump. And that he topped out, I think it was 58 percent of the Republican voters who were like, yeah, now I'm with this guy. When I think it is lowest, he might have been down all the way to like 35 percent, something like that. Uh, but I do think it's a little bit of a catch 22. And I'm curious what you think of this, because, yeah, it looks like he's almost a lock for a Republican primary. But then, yeah, once you get to a general, and by the way, I was not one of the people in 2016 who was like, he can't win. In fact, I was sounding the fucking alarm as soon as we knew it was going to be Hillary versus Trump. I was like, this guy could definitely fucking win. But looking at the landscape now, I mean, when Trump won in 2016, he got 9% of Democrats to vote for him. All those Democrats are gone. Every poll on independence is they're overwhelmingly like, fuck this guy. This guy's fucking crazy. And then you do have, albeit a small percentage of Republicans who are like, Man, no way. And then an, another group of Republicans who's like, I like him. I voted for him twice, but he's too goddamn toxic. So isn't it a catch-22 where he can crush in a primary, but then get curb stomped in a general? Maybe, but, you know, what gonna de- what's probably going to determine that are things that we can't really predict right now, like where the economy is going to be, where, where what prices right. are going to be like. I mean, yeah. we are in a very, very unstable uh, economic uh, moment. Uh, and I, I I don't know. I have no way of, of predicting where that's going to lead. But I think that that it's a live question up until the end, just because we have no way of knowing what the what the economic situation is going to be and, and how much people will have by that point decided that uh, the Brandon administration is sine qua non with uh, decline and high prices and uh, and uh, instability. I want to go back to what you were saying about how, you know, a Trump prosecution, even theoretically Trump being jailed, doesn't put the toothpaste back in the tube, doesn't really deal with the underlying problem. Because the counter to that would be that that is true. And I'm certainly of the view that Trump is the symptom, not the core problem, et cetera, et cetera, that just by jailing him, even I could see him running for president from prison and getting the nomination and all of those things. (laughs) But He does seem, on the other hand, to be a sort of singular figure. I mean, he has been able to, and this is part of, like, this is one of the worst things about him in some ways. He has made the central dividing line in our politics, not any sort of policy, but just how you feel about the person of Donald Trump. I mean, you see this really clearly on the Republican side. MAGA doesn't mean anything other than do you support Donald Trump in literally everything he says or do you not? But you also see it reflected in the Democratic side where, you know, Democrats now have favorable opinion of Liz Cheney and Ugh. these these other Ugh. very conservative right wing figures. So isn't he in a sense a, a sort of singular figure and uniquely charismatic leader where hobbling him does make a difference in terms of how the politics play out from here forward? I mean, beyond the charisma, though, you also have the fact that because he is outside of politics, because he he doesn't really have any political beliefs and he has no commitment to institutional legitimacy or the continuity, that he is uh, unlimited and and, and free and therefore dangerous in a way that even the most reactionary politician who at the end of the – who is still beholden to institutions like the Republican Party Mm -hmm. uh, that – that has no independent base can't be. Right. Uh, but uh, I think that while that is true, the the trend lines at this point, I think, are set. 
And while it's hard to imagine another figure coming in like Trump and embodying that destabilizing outsider uh, element, uh, the Republican Party is going to have to continue to find new ways to be react to to define themselves against the status quo. Uh, and and I mean, DeSantis in Florida is is the person who is most self consciously trying to turn Trumpism into a, a theory of governance and not just a, a personal style. Uh, and and we're seeing right now, like uh, if you give people a choice between those two, they, who who gives a crap about the actual governance? We we want the style. They the want the aesthetic. What we're all here for. Yep. Right. Exactly. And the aesthetic is always going to be what it is. Uh, but if you if Trump is off of the board, uh, I think you're going to see a, a a good chunk of his supporters just tuning out of politics. Hmm. But people who vote Republican are. St- still for the most part going to be voting in every election they're going to be there they're going to be waiting in line uh and they're going to have something in mind and some regular politician without his charisma maybe and without his uh, institutional independence uh is is going to emerge to fill that need uh because other because it, there cannot be a vacuum of that size uh in american politics to your point on it will this- I, I think best case scenario for them is that Whatever, whatever they're afraid of happening, whatever delegitimizing crisis they're afraid of being provoked, they have maybe uh, put it off for a bit. But I guess that's the only thing that power can do at this point. Uh, hmm. They can't really uh, assert any plan. All they can do is is put out fires as they emerge, even in even if in so doing, they're setting the stage for future crises that'll be even harder to contain. To your point on DeSantis. It's kind of amazing. He gets it so much more than uh, than Don Jr. gets it. I know Don Jr. is trying desperately to be his dad. I mean, he's do, you know recording videos. I don't even know where on Instagram or some shit where he's ranting and doing the hand motions just like his dad. And he's even over exaggerating the words like he says jabs mm. instead mm. of jobs. It's it's amazing to watch. It's incredible that you saw that compilation. Yeah. Of was, yeah. I was like, this is this is it's so cr- I've never the seen anybody Joe Biden. so de- Joe Biden. <laughs> he so desperately wants to be his dad. Um, and but yeah. but if you I, if you notice, this is interesting what I noticed. So Trump hasn't said a goddamn word about the student loan debt reduction, not a single word. And this is a guy who's been tweeting nonstop over on Truth Social, right? Or, truthing. Uh, truthing over on Truth Social, whatever. Now, if you notice- He's, he's been busting out the truths. <laughs> DeSantis has had like one side comment about like, oh, you don't want to pay for a fucking degree in gender studies and take it from a trucker or some shit, right? Yeah. But he's largely been more hands-off on that front too. And DeSantis did something recently. I don't know if you caught this. He did a press conference where he says, we're suing the FDA so that we can import- cheaper drugs from canada yeah and as soon as i saw that i was like oh that's the heir apparent to the trump throne because what trump did in 2016 was bucked a lot of gop orthodoxy in terms of the messaging in terms of how we governed he didn't i mean he was a sta- he was basically george w mm-hmm. bush as he governed but he would say things like not going to cut your social security not going to cut your medicare not going to outsource your jobs and DeSantis holding that press conference to argue for a policy which is flat out a left-wing policy and of course, he's also doing a shitty Trump impression with the hand stuff and whatnot and yelling at the media and everything. But that told me that the ideological roots of Trumpism, which, again, was a farce, but he understands that messaging component and he's embracing it more. Now, of course, having said all that, he's a massive hypocrite because the fucking IRA reduced the cost of some prescription drug prices and he didn't say a goddamn word about supporting that or even just that provision. Right. Mm-hmm. So but do do you see that, too? Do you see that, like. Don Jr., even though he's got like default support because he's Trump's son, he's got default support among the Republican base that ultimately he's sort of like a talentless hack and he's a fail son. Whereas DeSantis, I used to think, yeah, this guy might be overhyped. But now as I see him plotting, it looks like you made this point great on one of your one of uh, Chapo podcasts. You were like, he knows exactly how to tap into like the right wing hysteria of the moment and sort of capitalize on that yeah. and and then ride that wave. So do you agree with me that he's sort of like the heir apparent? No, he's definitely the one. I mean, he's definitely doesn't have the charisma. I, I finally heard him speak the other day, and I was astounded by what a squeaky voice dork he was. But <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and that's why he would never beat Trump in a general. And if he thinks, and if he's going to run against him, he better have like a plan B because that sounds like suicide to me. Because uh, I'd say his entire national uh, profile could get debol- demolished after a single debate. Yes. Uh, but but he certainly understands that. 
it, uh, if you assume that Trump is a uh, is going to be gone, and you know he is. I mean, if I'm if you're DeSantis, the smart thing to do is wait him out. You know, yeah. uh, is that in the in the absence of him, since there is no other Trump, there is no other celebrity who can like fill that spot, the the charisma void, and that means that at the most you have to compete against other regular politicians. Uh, the only way to define yourself against a, a establishment current that uh, at this point, the majority of GOP primary voters are sort of viscerally uh, suspicious of uh, is to make yourself the story and to put yourself on the front page and in the news for everything that uh, is bubbling up, every every story that comes up to to galvanize uh, right wing anger. Uh, and and he and being a governor allows you to do that. You can call for something and you can sign a bill, and that puts you uh, in the story and gives you some of that uh, celebrity heat, even if you can't meet Trump's uh, like actual star quality. Uh, and nobody else is really doing that. Yeah. Uh, and so he's he's really is the only one who understands that as as embarrassing as it might be to just be chasing hashtags as instead of actually governing. Uh, it's the only way to to replicate that sense of outsider um, uh, energy and uh, give people the idea that you're actually capable of offering an alternative. Yeah. But even I if th- you're actually not. I think in some ways your first point is the most important one, which is that's all fine and good. But ultimately, even his like, you know, very skilled manipulation of whatever the right wing moral panic of the day is, even though that has been very successful for him, none of it will matter if, you know, he gets crosswise with Trump and Trump decides like he's a rhino and then it's over. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you, like you see with Bill Barr right now, Bill Barr was like, I was literally handing out pamphlets for Barry Goldwater when I was 14 years old. But it doesn't matter because he got crosswise from Trump on the things that mattered, the Stop the Steel conspiracies and now the Mar-a-Lago raid. And so done, dead, you're a rhino. It's over. Yeah. Yeah, there's no there's no coming back from him like putting his Sauron eye on you. Uh and that's why I think DeSantis is is doing something very risky here. You can already see in in a few instances Trump is clearly annoyed with him. Right. Mm-hmm. He, he he because he is not disavowed running in 2024. And he uh, didn't he hasn't ask too public with it. But. He didn't ask Trump for his endorsement in the governor's race right. either. Yeah. Which is very very I, noteworthy. Yeah. I loved their fight over the vaccine. I ate that shit up. Whereas Trump did a couple interviews where he's yeah. like, you got these politicians out there. They won't even say it. They won't even say it. They got the booster. They know if they got the booster, they won't even say it. I mean, I think it's really sad. I think it's really weak. And DeSantis, you know, he was I don't even remember what he said in the press conference that Trump was pouncing on. But he just wouldn't acknowledge whether he had the booster. Yeah, or not. I and, think he basically like dodged the question. And it's funny because Trump has really backed off the vaccine thing, too, because he feels like he can't take on his base over that because he was originally taking credit. Like I did operation warp speed. I got us the vaccine. We saved millions of lives. This could have been a Spanish flu all over again, folks, but I saved the lives. And then he softened that. I remember one rally. He was like, you know, my people tell me I shouldn't talk about this, but we did something that was probably pretty good about the pandemic. (laughs) And then, and then now he's sort of like, just just totally abandoned it, it, which is crazy. That's like a rare area where Trump couldn't steer the base. You know what I mean? Yeah. He let that, he let that one go. well, that's just it. Is that is that he recognized that he couldn't steer them, and then he just yeah, he's like, Moved okay, on. fine, yeah, I'll keep that in my back pocket. What do you mean? Uh, yeah, like DeSantis is if he has a uh, if he has a, a plan to go against Trump, it's I'm going to appeal to the people who want Trumpism to be some coherent theory of governance, and you know that is that makes him more of like a Liz Warren type figure. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Exactly right. Uh, that's such a good point. No, He's you, appealing look, to people who will always be the tail of any group of voters, never going to be the actual like mass of them. Yes. And if you look at the polling of who is the DeSantis supporter right now and who is the Trump supporter, guess what? DeSantis does well with like the wine track Republican voters. It's the college yeah. educated, more affluent voters who are like, Media let's, too, yeah. let's move over to DeSantis, the Fox News ben, world. Ben dominant, Ed Dominich or whatever mm-hmm. he was talking yeah. about, Megan McCain's titties the other day. Oh, God. Did you see that? <laughs> yes, I did. It was in regard to DeSantis. Anyway, yes. sorry. <laughs> yes, but I, I do. I think the Elizabeth Warren comparison is, is the perfect one. That's exactly who DeSantis is. And so there'll be like a DC obsession with him. But he's never going to have the 
the like just pure like obsession and um, sort of raw emotion that Trump evokes, which is why, honestly, I actually think if Trump steps aside and it was Don Jr. versus DeSantis, it's not clear to me who wins in that battle, especially if, you know, senior comes in on the side of junior. I actually think that junior would be very difficult to beat, even as he's manifestly like, you know, unintelligent and so much less nah. talented than daddy. We should debate this one, Crystal. No way. <laughs> you don't buy it? What no. do you think, Matt? <laughs> he's, let me ask you, Matt, because I think Trump had an X factor. There even people, even like liberals and Democrats and even leftists, like they might try to deny it, but deep down they know he's got a weird charisma about yeah. him that works. Whereas Don Jr. has the opposite of that shit. He's got that shit where you're just anytime he speaks, you have that instinct of like, get away. Face likes Don Jr. He's yeah. got the aesthetic down. I mean, that's the thing is that he is he's got the voice and he's uh, he's willing to just totally hollow himself out and debase himself to to make his dad happy to make his his fans happy but it's i mean it to say people would be horrified by it or people would not uh not support him it requires you getting in the head of these people and at a certain level i can't i mean i get like the general uh appeal but like what specifically makes them like one thing over another or one yeah. candidate over another other than trump i don't know like I think it, it at that point, I think it sort of breaks down to to more individual choices. And uh, I'd, I, I'd say, yeah, if it's John Jr. versus DeSantis, I don't know. Like, but I, I just can't see that happening unless like Trump is, yes, in prison or dead. Uh, and if that happens, then maybe just that the him being like fallen, you know, uh, gives it gives it more of like a uh, uh, gives Don Jr. more of a claim because mm -hmm. he can explicitly run as a continuation of a bloodline or something. Yeah. But he'd have to deal with the fact that he's he's a gross little creep. Look, <laughs> I'm not good at knowing who the voters are going to pick. I, I do think I'm better than most at that, but I don't think anybody's really good at knowing who the voters are going to pick. Mm -hmm. I am excellent at knowing who the voters are not going to pick. How many times did the media try to build up some shitty fucking candidate like Tim Pawlenty back in the day? Yeah. And I was like, Tim Pawlenty, what the fuck are you talking about? There's I nothing mean, there. I just think if it, it, listen, this is all like way too hypothetical, theory, theoretical, whatever. But in a world where Trump is coming out hard against DeSantis and hard in favor of Don Jr., yeah, I give Don Jr. the edge because he's just made never, the Republican Party die before Jr. all runs. about himself. That's the only issue that matters. Who's on my side? Who's against me? You're That's forgetting it. Trump hates his son, too. You're forgetting that part. Oh, 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 that is true. Don Jr. is the one he hates want. the most. Don Jr. is trying so yeah. hard, though. He's trying so hard. Matt, I wanted to get your thoughts be, on, the, um, on the fascism discourse. Um, so, of course, you know, Biden called, uh, I guess, Trump and Trump aligned Republican politicians semi fascist. Um, there was a tweet thread the other day that was getting some attention from uh, Murtaza Hussein, who said, I still consider the high water mark of what felt like fascism in the U.S., the Bush Cheney years, extrajudicial disappearances, state sanctioned torture, expanding list of wars, most of the media transformed into cheerleading zombies. Nothing since compares with that. Um, what do you think about the sort of like the the renewed fascism discourse around Trump and the uh, overt efforts to steal the election? And as you were describing before, the fact that now it's not just Trump. Now you have an entire party that revolves around, you know, being willing to uh, steal elections whenever the results displease them. What do you think about all this? Uh, well, I definitely I remember that time and I definitely agree that the the vibe of the Bush era, especially like right after 9-11, uh, uh, 2002, right, 2003, was uh, was vastly more unifyingly uh, chilling mm -hmm. uh, than anything that we've had ever since. Uh, but I, 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 I guess I'm just a dork, a, a, a nerd. I have a hard time with the with the term fascism being applied to our current moment. I feel like one of the, I don't think you can you have a meaningful concept unless you, it, you are including in it the notion of mass-based violent politics that we don't have a context for because we are in a very real sense a post-political society like obviously culture is now suffused with politics and we all uh, are increasingly fusing uh, our politics with our cultural identities uh, but that's precisely because 
the actual zone of politics has been completely uh, depopul depopulated. I mean, we don't have political uh, identities in a meaningful way. We don't do anything other than watch political content, maybe argue about it, maybe buy a sticker or, or a T-shirt, uh, and then vote maybe once every four years or something. I mean, we don't do the sort of, we aren't involved in the sort of mass political institutions uh, that can create a, a street-based alternative to democratic politics. So <clears throat> I don't think fascism is a useful term. I think people want to use it because they feel like it does the job of raising the alarm uh, and pointing out like that we are seeing a real co a coalescing on the right around a anti-democratic, explicitly anti-democratic politics that was always there latently uh, and that is becoming more and more ex uh, uh, openly expressed now. That's yeah. a real phenomenon, but it does not have with it the attached popular movement. I mean, yes, we had uh, we did have uh, January 6th, but for one thing, that was only allowed to happen because uh, someone in government said it was okay. I, I still do not believe that uh, uh, that 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 the storming of the Capitol uh, at the at the final analysis was not a, a choice by some figures in government to be allowed to happen uh, for some uh, for the reason of of raising these um, uh, heightening these tensions uh, because uh, the capacity to stop a bunch of people who are essentially tailgaters from getting into the Capitol absolutely existed. It just was not utilized. Uh, but that's just it. It was a bunch of people who were brought as individuals to a, a, a party and they got riled up and then went uh, and kept going because they had too much energy. But as soon as the energy was dissipated, they all went home because there's nothing to contain any of their uh, feelings about politics. There are no institutions that they could be put into because nobody is going to suborn their will to somebody else. They're not going to take orders from anybody else, which is what you have to be willing to do to be an effective political agent. But that does not mean that uh, over time, you're not going to see a furtherance of, of the, the, the loss of formal uh, elements of, of democracy. But what this really just is, is a, uh, it's just a reveal of what was, What's been happening anyway? I mean, how? When was the last time you can say that there's there was a meaningfully democratic election in this country? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the threat is is really just that we can no longer realistically bullshit ourselves that that, that there is a democratic polity. So fundamentally, what I got out of that is you're making like a numbers argument, like basically, hey, since the numbers are, it, since it doesn't reach the bar that one would intuitively expect when you talk about fascism, therefore maybe it's not the best descriptor. Um, so I come at it from a little bit of a different perspective. So I'm actually sympathetic when people make the argument, when you're talking to normies and you bring up fascism, that's not really a great idea, namely because they immediately think of Hitler, they immediately think of Mussolini, and any sort of comparison between those figures and any modern American political figure, people are going to be like, oh, that seems a little extreme and a little off, maybe not all that accurate. So I'm sympathetic to that argument, um, which is why oftentimes when I'm talking about these things, I far prefer to use the term authoritarian versus fascist. But having said that, right, yeah, but having said that, looking like uh, to Murtaza Hussein's point, um, first of all, I think he's correct. We did see things under the Bush administration that really got the ball rolling for this sort of extreme politics. The difference is the Trump movement has taken the mask off of a lot of things we were already doing, like the torture, like the extrajudicial killings, like the drone strikes, like, you know, go down the list of everything, the NSA spying, uh, which was Patriot Act, et cetera. Um, but I, I do not object when anybody does use the word fascist. And to get back to your question about the Biden speech, I think the thing that annoyed me most about the discourse around that is that I watched the whole speech twice now, and it was very clear that he was so careful in delineating, like, look, this isn't the entire Republican Party. You know, uh, it, it's perhaps it's a minority. He even said that it's a minority of the Republican Party who he calls the MAGA wing, the people who are marching with Trump right off the cliff, and even had the qualifier semi-fascist so as to probably avoid the argument of like, 
oh, you're saying they're exactly like Hitler. Mm -hmm. Well, he put the qualifier semi, so I was like, no, but I'm saying in some key ways, they are clearly embracing the the prior tradition. And when you look at the definition, far right, authoritarian, ultra nationalist, uh, you know, political ideology, the belief in social hierarchy, always following the leader, etc. So I think he, it's it's fucking accurate. You know what I'm saying? So so when I heard it was people on the right, I think we're just lying about it. Like, I don't even think they believe the shit they were saying about it, right? Oh my God, no person has ever gone, no president has ever gone this far. Are you fucking kidding me? People whipped up a video of Trump in two seconds where he was calling left-wing people fascists. Like, my ass, nobody's ever said this. But I think when there were, there were pe some people on the left made the argument of like, oh, this is divisive. And it's like, first of all, it's fucking accurate. Second of all, don't deny the 80 caveats he brought into the conversation as well. So what do you think about that? Well, my my problem with that speech, beside the fact that it was clearly generated by interns and, and uh, comms people who spend too much time on Twitter, uh, <laughs> is that it's part of the broader democratic strategy, the only one they have left, uh, to solidify their gains among affluent white suburbanites and to make that the base of the party on the basis that they are the ones who have the most uh, money to donate. And they are also the ones who most vote, vote most consistently. Uh, and they're the ones who don't really expect anything from the government mm -hmm. other than to not do fascism. Uh, and that's something that they think, hey, we can actually deliver that as opposed to any kind of popular uh, uh, social reform, which they are structurally inca incapable of delivering. Uh, and, and, and so with that as their only move forward, they are sort of forced to attempt to otherize the Trump wing without neutralizing its appeal in any other respect, because that I don't think that that speech is going to uh, make anybody come to Jesus uh, any more than Trump being uh, charged with crimes would. Uh, there, th There's this fantasy that there still remains some uh, some center that can be appealed to some some non politicized uh, American institutional center that can uh, isolate someone like Trump and his movement and say, this is not who we are. This is outside of our tradition. But no one, even the Democratic voters at this point, has any real faith that such a thing exists. And so there can be no effective appeal to it because uh, everyone has sort of seen through that. That's what the most frustrating thing about the Trump era is that uh, we are seeing the scales falling away from so much of the consent manufacturing institutional uh, flim flam machine, but because it's been happening under Trump and because there's this united left liberal opposition to him, uh, that uh, that analysis becomes totally encoded with the rest of the Trump agenda, whatever you want to call that. It 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 it, it means that there's no way for a uh, disaffected Americans who uh, intuitively understand that that these institutions are not for them, that that this stuff is not to make their lives better, uh, but to not put that behind Trump because there is no uh, there is no other political current that accepts that. Uh, every everyone else is rallying around these institutions in this faltering flailing attempt to keep them up when it's far too late for that mm. uh, i was talking to a friend uh, and the real alternative to this whole phenomenon is if trump had run as a democrat in 2008 that's the only way we could have actually seen uh the institutional disillusionment that came with the uh 2008 crisis and its aftermath be put to any kind of productive use so um, let me take issue with some of that, because I would have agreed with everything you said there probably six months ago or a year ago. Um, but so I did have one issue with the Biden speech and my issue wasn't the same as the issue you had. My issue was it was too, like you said, it's all written by interns, too vague. There weren't any like specifics like, no, here's what I mean when I say this, when I say like, hey, this is kind of outside of the norm. I mean, the previous president was on Twitter or was on Truth Social yesterday saying, hey, just reinstate me as president. Like, I'm, so, <laughs> yeah, like, so give some specifics if you're going to use the, you know, the flowery rhetoric of like, oh, democracy is under attack. Like, uh, come on. I, we've heard this a million times. If you really want to get that through to people, you got to say, 
you know, whatever. Fucking Sarah Palin just lost, and she's saying it was rigged because it was ranked choice voting. It's like, fuck out of here. That's the way the system works, and it's correct. There's a, you know, on a majority of, uh, or what is it? Uh, a majority of people in the country have an election denier on the ballot who want to mm-hmm. outright outwardly overturn the election or at least question or whatever the fuck, right? So that was my issue with it. But, but, um, there has been, uh, you know, a streak recently of some things that I think any objective analysis would say, this is more than I was expecting. My, my um, feelings on what was going to happen uh, under the Biden administration uh, during the lull when he was down to like 33% approval rating, I was like, oh, so this is what's going to happen. We're literally going to get nothing the rest of his time in office, and the Democrats are going to get wiped out in a historic red wave, even bigger than the Tea Party wave in 2010. Uh, but then what happened? So we got gun reform, which includes the red flag laws at the state level, at least. And then the boyfriend loophole, super weak. But the fact that honestly, I didn't think we would get anything on that at all. So I was surprised we got even that right. Then we had the Chips Act, which has issues with it. It's there's it's corporate welfare to one extent or another. Bernie had issues with it. I think he was correct to bring up those issues. But the general idea behind the Chips Act is like, let's bring back microchip manufacturing in this country because we need to. Right. Because it's a national security thing because the pandemic showed the supply chain was all fucked up. We can't rely on Taiwan. China might invade there tomorrow. Eighty percent of the microchips come from there. We got to do it here. Right. I like that. Then you had the PACT Act, which was the health care for veterans who were exposed to toxic burn pits. Then you had the Inflation Reduction Act, which, again, is weak tea compared to the Build Back Better bill, which was killed by Manchin and Cinema, But it does have a 15 percent uh, minimum corporate tax rate, which is phenomenal because a lot of these corporations paid zero percent or even got subsidies back. $64 billion more for Obamacare, some cheaper prescription drug prices, tax credits for uh, electric vehicles. The Democrats did the most base thing I've ever seen them do when they slipped in a provision to re-regulate carbon dioxide and redefined it as a pollutant because the Supreme Court had slapped that down and said, yeah, the EPA is not allowed to do environmental protection anymore because we declare that. And the Democrats secretly slipped a provision into the IRA that says, actually, we can do that because carbon dioxide is a pollutant. So what now, bitch? Most base thing I've ever seen Chuck Schumer and the Democrats do, by far. And then when you got the student debt reduction, you know, Janet Yellen, his Treasury Secretary, was like, don't do it, don't do it. Jill Biden, his wife, was like, don't do it, don't do it. And, of course, Schumer was saying do 50. Uh, Bernie and the progressives were saying get rid of all of it. I was expecting nothing, really, if I'm being honest, but at the most, the $10,000 for 125 and under. And he did go beyond that. He did 20000 for the Pell Grant recipients. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did a cap of 5% of your monthly income in terms of the payment, which is a phenomenal provision, which people aren't talking about nearly enough, right? And so I see this string of wins, and I don't care how Biden got there, because he almost certainly got there from, like, the fact that he felt, I, I have to do, I see the polls with young people. I'm at, like, fucking 10% or some crazy shit. If I don't do this, I'm going to get my ass handed to me on a silver platter. I don't care how he got there. The fact is, he got there. And, and none of these things are sufficient, but it's something. And so... When you mix that with the fact that I do think Trump and the Republicans have gone so fucking insane and extreme that the stuff I used to roll my eyes at, like, oh, look at this resistance liberal garbage. Now I look at it, I'm like, "Eh, it's kind of true. So I do feel a sense of like renewed optimism in a sense. And in that Biden speech, he also pointed out a lot of those policy wins that I just talked about. So what do you make of that? Is my optimism misplaced or am I like accurately analyzing the situation? I'd say that the, the the single most important uh, factor in the perception of of uh, the ch- of <clears throat> the perception uh, perceived shift towards Biden and the Democrats uh, is something that they had nothing formally to do with, which was the Dobbs decision, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that validates the the only. Re- the only consistent democratic strategy in their post Carter era, when they can only ever fiddle at the margins uh, and cannot really address any significant problems uh, from the, from like the central vantage and the assumed capacity that they had, you know, the new deal, the great society era, uh, which is to wait for Republicans to overstep uh, and then get the, the relatively unideological voter who might vote Republican because they blame whoever's ever in charge for economic conditions and things are bad for de- under Democrats, so therefore they're going to vote for Republican, will make them not do that and make them actually take a step back and be like, actually, maybe uh, these particular Republicans uh, are not worth voting for. Uh, and you've seen this significant shift in special elections 
towards the Democrats since the Dobbs decision and in the polling. Uh, and I think if they're going to uh, do better than people anticipated in November, uh, which I think at this point their best, their most likely good scenario is they hold on to the Senate, uh, still lose the House, though, bit narrowly. Uh, it'll be for the reason that they usually are able to pull one out, because the Republicans in power, uh, their relationship to their base is such that they can't do the sort of uh, triangulation and sail cutting that Democrats do without undermining the engine of their electoral fortunes. They have to overstep. And then as a result of that, they have to lose the winnable races, the same way that they lost a bunch of winnable Senate races in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, but then they win the next presidential election. People get used to things as they are. People, they, the, 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 out, over, the overstep, the horror of the Republicans is normalized. And then you're back essentially to square one and people voting based on the conditions occurring when, they're, when the election occurs. And with only two parties to choose from, the Republicans will inevitably be returned to office. Unless, now the Democrats could do something about that, but it would require doing the sort of things that only Republicans are capable of like adding states to change the Senate uh, calculus, like mm -hmm. doing anything about gerrymandering at the state level. Mm -hmm. uh, but they can't do those things. And so they can't keep those gains. They can't build off of them. They will always inevitably, the, the, the ocean comes back in and the sand castles get knocked over. I think the student loan debt example, though, is really interesting and really instructive because... Um, Yes, of course, they should cancel all the debt and, you know, $10,000 or $20,000 isn't sufficient. However, um, we shouldn't downplay that this is for 43 million people, a uh, life-changing um, and life trajectory altering experience. And that idea starts really uh, in the mainstream with Occupy. Um, it's picked up by, you know, activists at Occupy. Then it's picked up by the Sanders campaign that Still really signed to 2016 it, and then Bernie. Up right. But Bernie's really the one who popularizes it, you know, and but puts it in into the mainstream, she's in the, into chain. the mainstream yeah. conversation. So Bernie 2016, then, you know, Bernie 2020, when he runs again, basically every candidate in the Democratic primary is forced to take some kind of a position on student loan debt, including Joe Biden, who makes one of the, you know, sort of most middling offers here, but is very clear and on the record on. It. And so even though it's really apparent that he did not want to do this, <laughs> did not like the idea, was extremely reluctant, dragged his feet about it for a million years before he got around to doing it, because the issue had been forced like that from activists to the, you know, Democratic primary stage and ultimately, you know, into the general election, he's forced in the position of doing something that is genuinely good materially for a lot of people and immediately turned around his approval ratings um, with young people because of that pressure that has been applied. To me, that might be the single most instructive and potentially hopeful thing uh, that has happened in recent political memory. It, that, that is definitely true, but the only reason that he was able to do it and the only reason that they were able to settle on that as as the uh centerpiece of this attempt to win back uh, these young voters is because it's something that is within the president's authority to unilaterally carry out right but i'm uh, saying like they that's, they that's are, outside of though just here and here's the other caveat to it just to sort of bolster your point i mean the other thing is it doesn't really challenge any you know the banks are cool with it the schools are cool with it no, like, large entrenched right. moneyed interest. That yeah, doesn't do anything to reduce the price of going to yes. college in the future. Absolutely fair. But it's also fair to say this isn't something that's just exclusively in the lane of, like, well, we're not going to do anything for, for you, but at least we're not going to force raped 10 year olds to have their rapist <laughs> babies, right? It isn't in the lane of lesser evil politics. So in that way, and it's also not a neoliberal idea. I mean, this is a, you know, this is like an idea that comes straight out of um, leftist Occupy, Jill Stein, Bernie land. And to me, that uh, philosophically marked a really important break as well. I, I It is, it is, it is uh, definitely a break, but it, it can't be really repeated because anything else that could have a similar effect on people's lives would require 
a, a legislative fix, which it is it cannot happen. The, the Democratic Party uh, cannot govern. So, uh, I mean, yes, we have the we have the 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 IRA and all that, but like when you look at the scale of the problems we're facing, look at the scale of the threats at every at every sector to to just continuation of of the system as it exists, let alone uh, 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 the threat to our capacity to maybe make things uh, structurally better for people, mm-hmm. uh, the, the capacity to address them doesn't exist. Uh, do you mean the capacity? That means- when you say the capacity, do you mean just literally the majorities in Congress? Or do you mean like, you know, the imp- influence of money and the lack of will and the fact that the people who are in power in the Democratic Party basically benefit from things as they are and, and a large part of their voting base as well. Uh, yeah, they, they're structurally incapable because the party can only answer to its donors. The party can only answer to the people who keep the lights on. And that's not the citizens. It's not their voters. Uh, and they can't enforce the, the party itself has no ideological coherence. It has no project. Uh, the, the, the Democratic Party at this point is entirely a um it's a professional organization basically it's like a big linkedin page mm-hmm. for a bunch of individual political entrepreneurs who are all looking after their own career prospects mm-hmm. and the ladder of success however you want to define it uh, uh either in terms of political power or uh in terms of money uh is paved by uh by the interests that control the party. Uh, I mean, and they cannot enforce any sort of discipline on uh, on their elected officials from the center either, as we saw during the uh, Build Back Better debate. Mm-hmm. So there can't be any addressing of problems that undermines the interests of the actual uh, influencers of the party. Uh, and so they're left with things like uh, re- reducing a percentage of student debt, uh, not too much. You can't let all of these people off the hook completely because then that's going to increase their bargaining power with their employers and we can't have that. I, uh, but we can give them enough to feel that there's been some relief because, I, specific, because we are able to uh, address that purely from an executive perspective. We don't have to go to Congress to do anything about it. And anything, any real impact, anything that could really change things, anything that really address the crises, the, the manifest and a growing crisis we face uh, would require a, uh, a legislative approach that the party is incapable of generating. So I largely agree with that. I think so. My nickname for Joe Biden is bare minimum Biden. I keep calling him bare minimum Biden. And you can look at that with, I mean, the intuitive way to look at that is with a negative connotation. Oh, he's doing the bare minimum. But in the current political context, there's a positive connotation for that too, which is like, okay, he's doing the bare minimum. Well, what the fuck's everybody else doing? What are the Republicans doing? They're going like a thousand miles an hour in the wrong direction. They're doing way less than the bare minimum. In fact, they're actively going in the wrong direction. So look, the, the key part of the analysis that I think is important that a lot of people are missing is that I do think the Republicans have gotten more and more extreme recently, which then makes the bare minimum look a lot more attractive. And there is a, there is a model there. So I agree with your point that structurally they're not going to do anything that really, you know, uh, pisses off their donors, that really shakes up the system in any serious way. Um, but the roadmap in the past was when FDR did basic, mild social democratic reforms. He won the White House four times. He held 80 percent of the House and the Senate. And basically, Americans dropped their panties the second they got a tiny little taste of social democracy. So given that framework that we just laid out here, if Biden were to, let's say, and there's no way he's going to do all of these things, but I'm just spitballing here. If he were to deschedule marijuana and decriminalize it himself, which he's not going to do because he's a drug warrior. And I think that's one of the few things he actually fucking believes. His ideological um, one in spite of his son. Yeah. Right. If he were to actually eliminate student loan debt, which by the way, he has the authority to do, he used some justification, some COVID provision to justify it. He shouldn't have done that. Should he use the 1965 Higher Education Act? They clearly have the right under that to do it. I don't know why they didn't do that. But anyway, 
if he were to get rid of all student loan debt, if he were to unilaterally on his own lower all prescription drug prices, which again, he has the right to do under the buy dole act. Um, he's just not exercising it. They got some drugs lowered in the IRA, but if he were to do like just those three things, then we're starting to talk about a little more than the bare minimum, even though, again, we haven't addressed anything structural. Like we're not talking about Medicare for all, we're not, like not structural granted. But if he were to do that shit, I think he would, the Democrats would win in a landslide. And we're already talking about sort of like an even split here, uh, just because, like you said, of, I think, Dobbs and because of the student loan debt reduction. So do you agree with that? That like, there actually is a path that previously, if you asked me a year ago, I'd be like, oh, fuck, I'm super depressed. I'm super pessimist pessimistic. I see no path. I see no hope of him doing anything at all, even doing the bare minimum like the student loan debt reduction. Do you agree that there actually is some sort of a path here? Because for the first time in a long time, I actually see something. Well, I guess the question is a path to what? I mean, a path to Biden getting reelected? No, no, no. Probably, a, yeah. A path, I mean, a path yeah. to finally breaking the spell of the neoliberal era, which granted requires a lot more reform and requires some way of getting money out of politics and ending the corporate and billionaire control of our political system. But th there are two competing things here. Number one is pleasing the donors. Number two is protecting my own ass and my own career and being able to get reelected. And there is a little bit of a lesson embedded in what Biden just did with the student loan debt reduction, which is, holy shit, now I just skyrocketed in my popularity, not just with young people, but in the country more generally. And that is something that was a net good for people. So maybe if you actually deliver for people, then, you know, you'll th there will be you'll be paid back by the electorate. I. I. Uh, you could like I said, uh, Biden could have could find a, a, a executive office sort of fix to the the legislative gridlock that could make him relevant and that could get him, get the young people back on his side enough to, to maybe, yeah, get reelected. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that there's any way for it to be built upon because like you listed those things, but like once you run out of executive branch uh, uh, solutions, once you run out of those things that are, can bypass legislative, but we're you kind still of forgetting, have- We're kind of forgetting about the reconciliation process though. I mean- there's a world in which Democrats manage to hold on to the House and uh, a, I think probably more probable road to them picking up a couple seats in the Senate, taking the mansion cinema issue off the table. And then you're in a world where, hey, do you take another crack at some of the Build Back Better provisions? Now, I'm skeptical how far they'll go there because I think they've bought into the right wing narrative about inflation being driven by, yeah. you know, workers not starving yeah. to death. That and rotating villain theory too. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but you know, they're like, we shouldn't forget that they did just get something significant through the reconciliation process. We shouldn't forget that Bernie is still the chair of the budget committee and he hasn't forgotten about the other things that were on the list there that he wanted to get done. So, he wouldn't only be limited to the realm of executive action, potentially, if they have, you know, a better than expected midterms here. And that's still an outside shot. Yeah, uh, th they could pass something, but uh, I think the same the same dynamics that whittled down the 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 big agenda that got everybody's eyes wide at the beginning of the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. That's those same dynamics will play. As you said, the rotating villain. I mean, if, if you don't if Na Manchin and cinema are neutralized, well then you've got uh uh Chris Da or what's his name? Uh Mark the Warner guy, the will Delaware pop up. Bald, bald, Chris Coons. Yeah, Mark Warner. Dude. Like the Coons, that's it. Like yeah. those guys, there's there's a half a dozen of these people. Maggie Hatton who just another at one. this point don't have they can say I'm in favor of all this stuff. Because it doesn't matter, none of it will pass. If that changes, then their calculus changes, and then all of a sudden they have a problem with it, and this and this and it ha renews itself again. We see the incapacity. Well, the thing is, we have seen definitively the incapacity of the executive branch to meaningfully influence uh, Senate. One, for, you could argue about why that is, but the incapacity has been uh, manifest. We've mm -hmm. seen it. And so that doesn't change, even if they get a few more seats in the Senate. Uh, so they could they could give a sensation of forward movement that, again, I think maybe could push Biden into reelection, especially if he has to run against uh, a, a 
Trump who can't shut up about the last election. <laughs> um, but like the 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 crisis concept context doesn't go anywhere mm -hmm. and that's going to create new political fissures new degrees of disillusionment people c c turning out of politics in droves and the people who are turning into politics doing so specifically on the culture war firmament that gets them off mm -hmm. yeah. because it's the only thing it's the only game in town left mm -hmm. uh and that will be that that process nothing we that biden can do can neutralize that drift because is there anything realistically we can imagine them doing about uh about global warming or about the uh the long-term uh fraying of uh of all of the uh supply chain shit that keeps all this stuff going like that that th those that would require the sort of massive investment in domestic infrastructure that as said cannot be carried out by the federal government yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sort of with you on that. I'm I'm pretty pessimistic about uh, the House and the Senate in general. I I mean, I was honestly floored that they managed to pull off even the IRA. I mm -hmm. was I couldn't believe it. And and Schumer had to be a gangster for a hot minute about that, where he lied to McConnell and told McConnell like, yeah, 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 vote for the Chips Act and don't worry. M McConnell said, well, I'm only going to get you the votes for that if there's no more reconciliation. And Schumer was like. OK, go ahead. We're fine. No more reconciliation. And then he turned around. And as soon as they passed that, he was like, so we have a deal on reconciliation. I was like, whoa, what the fuck? Chuck Schumer pulled a, a move that literally like Mitch McConnell himself would have pulled. So I, but I'm still generally pessimistic because I tend to agree that like some of the other people will pop up to play the villain. And I think the rotating villain theory is generally true. I could see maybe like if Democrats pick up seats, you could maybe see like a, you know, a paid Child maternity tax leave credit. bill yeah or the child well that that would be a big deal the child tax credit thing but like mm -hmm. certain things i could see but I, i'm actually a little more optimistic about honestly the it, you know the it, executive route because i think that I, honestly <laughs> i think people sort of underestimate just how powerful the the president is i think it, it almost can't be overstated how powerful i mean like we're about to see now uh there are reports that we're on the brink of getting right back into that iran deal which is like, you know, under a Trump, not only did that not happen, the exact fucking opposite happened. <laughs> well, you saw it with a baby formula shortage, too. Right, where yeah, it was the like, Defense Production Act. Once right. they decided, like, oh, shit, we got to do something about this, suddenly they figured out <laughs> that they had government power and abilities to take care of that. I guess, Matt, I'm curious about what your overall sort of view of where the neoliberal project is at this moment. Something Kyle and I um, often debate off air, being the yeah, super I'm, nerds that we are. And I'm more of a pessimist than you are on that in general, the neoliberal era. Yeah, so do you feel it, yeah. like neoliberal era still large and in charge, cracking and fraying at the margins, or do you feel like it's over? I feel like... Uh, the popular legitimacy is gone. Like it, yeah. it, neoliberalism as a governing theory of politics that animates the um, that animates uh, like the narrative of politics and 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 that is part of the uh, electoral appeal of political parties. Uh, I think that is over. I think I think that everyone understands that the, the markets have not done the job. And so uh, it's impossible to argue on their merits. Uh, but as a uh, governing structure, there's nothing to uh, compete with it. There is no material base to provide an alternative to it. So it continues going, it, it just continues on. What we get instead is this zombie neoliberal politics, which uses, uh, which replaces the 90s and early aughts idea of oh yes we're gonna rise all the boats with uh, all this deregulation that nobody believes anymore uh, and replaced it with a new politics of uh, sadism basically uh, that that says we now know that the government can't actually do anything we've naturalized neoliberalism and we've removed it as a political project and just made it a force of nature mm -hmm. uh, what the government can do is it can punish the people that you think are responsible for why things have gotten this bad uh, and and that is now the new terrain of of electoral politics and and the new language of of the party of the parties 
uh, but the engine running it is the same as it's been because there is no, there, there truly still is, as Margaret Thatcher said, no alternative. There are no, there are no materially based structures to, to uh, generate alternative uh, uh, economics or politics. What about the grassroots labor movement? I mean, it's, it's, it is, if it, if we, if there is going to be a challenge, that's where it will come from. But at this stage, it is still incredibly nascent. I mean, it's, it's being built from the ashes of the last of, of a destroyed labor movement. Uh, and it's emerging out of, you know, those, uh, that broken thing. And, and it, it that my hope comes from the fact that like this, this new labor movement is sort of unencumbered with the past is, uh, yeah. not tied in to the previous regimes of uh of brokerage that 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 governed uh labor politics uh and so it has a capacity to generate uh new political currents new ideas uh and that in the struggle for them those things will be forged uh but it's it's absolutely in its very early stages and do you uh, see do you see trumpism as neoliberalism just with like culture war on top I mean, all of it is like every every everything that can get you every current of politics that can get you in office now is uh, part of one machinery, uh, it, it, and like Trumpism is just a a patch basically on on the uh, the one of the problems created by neoliberal governing, which is well, if you tell everybody that that. Uh, like the government can't really do anything mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, that, that this stuff is just going to keep getting worse. And yet you still insist on having elections. What the hell are you supposed to get people to care about enough to come out for them? And Trumpism is a patch on that and helps solve it, mm -hmm. but it, it cannot, it, it, but it only solves that question of maintaining the, uh, the kayfabe of, of political uh, elections. It does not address the, the material basis of, of uh, our economy. Matt, my dude, you're absolutely brilliant. I love, uh, I could listen to you babble all day about politics. And I oftentimes do do that. I do mm -hmm. listen to him babble all day about politics. So tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, Chapo Trap House is our, my, the podcast I co-host with Felix Biederman uh, and Will Miniker. And I'm also, uh, I Twitch stream sometimes, uh, twitch.tv Chapo Trap House there. Nice. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so that was Matt Chrisman of Chapo Trap House. Um, some people say Chapo, some people say Chapo. It's similar to the Mario Mario debate. Mm. Yeah, we won't get into that one. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, I love that guy. I think he's brilliant. Um, he actually inspired a, a video we did recently. I was uh, perusing the old YouTubes one day, and I saw that uh, they posted a segment of... I think it was just Matt and Will. Felix wasn't there that day for whatever reason, but they were going over the uh, Republican power rankings mm -hmm. that Washington Post put out. And it was so fucking funny. And then I was like, hey, we should probably go over it, you know, too. And, and we did. We did a, a video in the car talking about that. But yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun picking his brain because he does think about things in like a very interesting, different way, brings up points that I hadn't thought of before. So that I got dude, a lot on He it. is an original thinker, which is why I love him. Yeah. You do not hear Matt Chrisman saying some shit that he heard from somebody else or, you know, some other commentator he likes. It's all like, I'm thinking this and I'm thinking it right now and I don't care where if you try to pigeonhole me as a result of that or whatever. He's a very original thinker. Um, I do think, though, he's more pessimistic than I am at this moment, mm -hmm. which is it's rare for me to say that because I'm used to being the pessimistic one. Yeah. You know, I'm used to being the skeptical one. But there were already like four things deep that I did not expect. I was starting to think Biden was going to stay at that 33 percent number. I started to think he was going to do absolutely nothing moving forward. And he did a lot. And I agree that Roe versus Wade being overturned had a huge impact on the electoral prospect, electoral yeah, prospect. Oh, Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. But let's say Roe versus Wade was not overturned and he had this streak of things that he just did. His approval number would still go up because helping 43 million Americans materially has a big impact. That one in particular, I feel like has been really clear. I mean, you saw the approval rating with young people turn around. Of course. Right away. Oh, you did something for me. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, look, there's a 
certainly our skepticism of the Democrats continues and is warranted in terms of the limits of how far they'll go when it comes to challenging the, you know, money yeah, interest. He's right that, about that part. That back them. There's no yeah. doubt about it. But there are other things like the student loan debt relief that fall into that uh, zone of like good things that genuinely benefit people and do not directly challenge or upend profit centers. So the child tax credit is a good example of, time off. of that paid time off. It does a little bit, but mostly not. I mean, things Studies like... Studies show that it doesn't reduce um, productivity. Yeah. So. I know the Chamber of Commerce has, like, been against it oh, in the okay. past, though. Fair, but, okay. yeah. Fair point. But, I mean, yes, there are things... Child tax credit is a good... Affordable child care is another one. Universal pre-K is another one. There are some things that business... I mean, business liked the sort of not-that-amazing infrastructure deal that they passed last year because it had lots of private contracts that they could give out. Well, there's a lot more building that we could be doing that would be extraordinarily beneficial and would employ people. And those could be union jobs and prevailing wage and all of those things. So there are more things that can be done that fall in the zone of good, good for Democrats electorally and not a threat to moneyed power that you could conceive of them doing if they have a better than expected midterms. And at the same time that all that's going on, you really do have a Republican Party that is more extreme than I've seen in my lifetime. Now I'm including the Bush era because it has all the same um, all the same policies as the Bush era continued. Right. Mm -hmm. So pr Trump signed a pro torture executive order. You still got the illegal NSA spying going on. You still got the wars going on. So all that stuff is still going on. That's part of the machinery of the Republican Party. And to, in many ways, the Democratic Party as well, to a, yeah. a different degree. Right. But then on top of that, you do have the added layer now of the open denying of democratic elections and a fucking psychopath saying every other day, I demand to be reinstated as president or at the very least redo the election. And then you have all of his little sycophants who are out there uh, and, and either defending it or not condemning it. And so now we're in a situation where uh, the majority of Americans have a flat out election denier on the ballot. That is a, is a, that's a bridge too far. And, and I sincerely believe that when the American people look at somebody who has like 14 fucking investigations into them, that is not a net benefit politically. It may be in the Republican primary. Yeah. It may be among that base, but they're about to get a fucking dose of reality, especially if Joe Biden does one more half decent thing. One more half decent thing mixed with these fuckers marching off a cliff at a thousand miles an hour. Well, and it's going to be a wave in the other direction. To be honest with you, the election denial stuff isn't even the most... I think, significant in terms of voters judging the Republican Party as being not for them. I do think the um, the things that have come out about where Republicans really stand on abortion has been more eye opening. So it's like, you know, oh, wait, you really actually are going to force like you are actively defending forcing a 10 year old to bear their rapist baby. That is like a three percent position in America. And in even in swing states, a lot of these people are still all in. And I'll do you one better than that, too. I agree with all that. Also, they had a vote in the House. A hundred and fifty seven Republicans voted no on gay marriage. A hundred and ninety five voted no on the right to contraception. Yeah. OK, we just got news today. Ron Johnson and there was another uh, Republican senator came out and said, I'm a no on gay marriage. I know Ted Cruz. OK, just did. maybe that's your thing. I, yeah. I get that this is your like your base, right? The evangelical Christians. I get it. Those fuckers are 30% of the population max. Gay marriage polls at 70% now. Mm -hmm. Every single independent in the country is looking at you like, are you fucking crazy? Yeah. Think of somebody like Joe Rogan, who literally just the other day was like, yeah, vote Republican, right? How, how long would a guy like that, a, a Roganite type person, be able to sit there listening to a Republican talk about, yeah, Deny the 10 year old rape victim and abortion. Yeah, I'm against gay marriage. Yeah, you don't even have a right to a condom or like the pill. Yeah. How long are they going to take that before they're like, you know what? I tap out. I'm gonzo. It's a very different story when, uh, you know, Ron DeSantis and these others, they were all in for the conversation about like, you know, woke ideology in schools and banning transgender ideology in schools and these things and wanting to keep it in that lane of like, no, 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 we wouldn't touch gay marriage. Of course, that's settled. That's done. And now, that that's the active issue on the table, 
it's very revealing and it's very uncomfortable to her for them. And does, you know, they had sort of just decided we're not going to talk about, we basically lost on gay marriage. We're just not going to talk about it, but they still have a very strong, organized activist, religious right base that was never on board with it is still not on board with it is clearly putting pressure even on someone like Ron Johnson, who is in trouble elect- electorally mm-hmm. for his uh, reelect there in a very swingy state. Um, they're even in that state able to apply enough pressure to him that he basically flipped his vote because he had indicated previously that he was probably going to go the other way on this one. Wow. Um, so I'm sure you saw this, but I just want to bring it up. It's a good note to end on here. Uh, right wing group just filed a petition with the Supreme Court. Now they're going for the whole enchilada. Now they want to ban abortion nationwide by defining a fetus as a person and giving them rights under the 14th Amendment. So, and it's funny because remember in the wake of Roe being overturned, yeah. everybody and their mother on the right was like, this was it. This was the Holy Grail. We're done. Like, that's it. We just want to leave it up to the states, bro, because we're federalists. We believe in federalism. Right. You know, the states are the laboratory democracy. It's fine. California wants abortions. New York, totally fine, bro. Well, some However of them, many months later, ban it everywhere. Some of them said that. And some of them, like Mike Pence. He was the only one I saw. Presidential yeah. ambitions immediately jumped out and said, now it's time to do this nationwide. And there's already an org. I can't remember how many co-sponsors it already has in the House and the Senate. I mean, there's already an organized push to codify a nationwide at the federal level ban on abortion. So that was a sub project they've been working on on the side for a while. And you can bet, again, because this is a very, very organized, powerful, influential part of the Republican base that puts a lot of pressure on Republican officials to be where they, you know, where they want them to be. They're going to in, you know, in Republican primaries, they're going to be a lot of pressure to put take those positions. And you can see like Blake Masters, a great example here where he's, of course, the Arizona senator, senatorial nominee on the Republican side during the abortion during the primary. He was all in on like abortion is genocide and, you know, we need a national heartbeat bill and all of this stuff literally deleted that all off his website. Once he won the nomination because he realized what a problem it is for him with the general electorate. But I mean, this is the modern age. You can't just like hide that. shit. Yeah. People know you said it and right. they're running ads about it. <laughs> well, it, and also the thing is like, but what do you actually want to do? Like if given the opportunity now that you've been on both sides of that, mm-hmm. you're probably going to go along with the crowd when you're in there and you probably would vote for it. Right. Like you don't yeah. know. Now you don't know what the guy like well, what the because, guy stands for. Because if you don't someone's likely to come along in a Republican primary and be like, well, he said he would do this Mm -hmm. and then he voted against it. I'm the guy who really will force the 10 year old to have the rapist baby. Anyway. All right, guys, there you have it. Um, Thank you all for supporting us on Substack. We appreciate that very much. You guys make this show work. We don't talk to any advertisers. If you notice, you've never uh, heard us reading ads, (laughs) right? Which we're very proud of that fact. Unless it's seltzer and then Kyle may be tempted. I'll do it for free. I mean, you don't need to pay me. I like seltzer. (laughs) I'll talk about that. (laughs) I also happen to like fast food and I talk about that all the time too, even though they don't pay me. Taco Bell, holla at your boy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You and Jeff Stein. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Well, I would debate him though because he says the Crunchwrap Supreme is his favorite. Mm. Crunchwrap Supreme is good. It's good. Gordita Crunch is better. I'm with you on this one, babe. OD! Gordita Crunch is better. B- 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 bang it. It's so good. Underrated is the um, Fiesta potato soft taco. Um, I think I've only had that once, but I it was an enjoyable experience. So good. Yeah. There was also, so they came out with some new shit that was really good. Some like Chalupa thing. Was, I'm a Chalupa fan also. Oh, Chalupas are, Chalupas are the, the flaky the warmness supreme, of the fucking. Chicken. Now we're doing a free ad for, for Taco Bell right now. <laughs> I actually I haven't had Taco Bell in a long time. You it's haven't? Been, it's been a minute. Yeah. I mean, it hasn't it's been for me. It happened today. <laughs> uh, um, I got other things in mind for today. But anyway. All right, guys. <laughs> we love you. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> Bye.